hit it strong. so good I'd like for them to do that again they may be out of breath though <laughs> so, <laughs> easy thank you all very much music ministry we appreciate that well friends happy Easter to you okay now y'all can do better than that okay happy Easter okay thank you I appreciate that I needed that um, God bless you all friends uh, the reason that our church exists really comes out of a mission statement that we developed a few years ago as we were praying uh, one time on a leadership retreat up near Tallulah Gorge and uh, 
the statement is this, that um, we are to engage our community with the good news of Jesus and equip believers to become devoted followers of Christ. So engaging our community, we seek to do that, uh, beginning here in the Five Points area and then broadening out throughout Athens and then to the ends of the world as Jesus directs us. And so part of that territory then of our community is down in Cuba. So I went to Cuba a couple times last year on mission trips, and one of the things that we found out was was that there was a um, there was a church, a house church, that things were being blessed by God. And by the way, down in Cuba, um, they will not allow you. Um, the government tries to keep control over the church, which is kind of funny because you can't control Jesus. But anyway, they try, and so they will not allow you to build a new church building, but they will allow you to be in homes and houses. I guess that way they think they can kind of put a lid on the growth of Christianity. So um, in this one house church, they were growing and they were meeting in the largest um, room in the house, which was their garage. They had about 125 people, but they need more space. And so they had this problem. And uh, I spoke with the DS and his wife who were living there. It's a pastor down in Cuba, Methodist pastor. And... um, their idea was, was that they wanted to build a parsonage or a home right next to their house so they could move into that and then let the church just grow into the rest of the home, the rest of the footprint. So um, our leaders felt challenged by that, and our, our missions team decided to donate $4,000 that we could send down there to help begin the construction project. Funny thing is, is that in America, $4,000 won't even get you a porch. But down there, when you pair the American dollar with the Cuban peso, it goes a long, long way. So they've been able to have a vigorous start to this building campaign. So you see here, um, they've already got a, a team of people that are, that are on the grounds. It's nice because it's local artisans. And they have come to build now a house for the pastor and his wife to then move into. And you see them steady at work. What I like about this picture is, is that if you, if you do the, the math, you count, there are nine people. So the nice thing is with the money that we're able to give them for this building project, they're able to use these, these local craftsmen, um, giving them jobs, because a lot of people down in Cuba don't have jobs. Not all of them do, certainly not well-paying jobs. So it, it sends a nice buzz throughout the community when they know that the church is there to help them has a really positive effect. So just want to give you an update about that. It's rather exciting, and I know that uh, people want to continue to give to that. Well, friends, looking at the scripture here that, uh, that God has given us that has already been read, we find here that uh, from the good news translation is that something has happened on that first Easter morning. But before I really get into that, let me, let me say this. Um, and I want to try to really keep it real with you. You were born into a dead hope. All of you were. So was I. You see, before you knew God, Everything that you are counting on, everything that that made life fulfilling to you, all of it has a dead end. All of it. Maybe it's your career that really juices you. Maybe that's the thing that just kind of like, man, yeah, this is why I exist. I was made for this. One day that career, regardless of how good it is, even one day Kirby Smart you know, who's, who's had a, having a fantastic ride as the head coach at UGA. Even one day, his career is going to end, right? Now, I know, I know a lot of Bulldog fans hope that's not until he's 90 years old. So, so maybe so. Um, but, but if it's not career, maybe it's your family. Maybe your family just, it, it's just so special, and it should be. Um, but that's why you, you just feel like, I, you know, I exist for my family. One day... 
either you're going to leave earth first or one of your family members is going to leave earth first and you're going to be separated from them. Maybe it's land that is your thing and you love just to have the acres that you live on. One day you're no longer going to have control over that, over that land. So everything in this life ends. It fails or it breaks. Boy, I tell you what, I was reminded of that last week um, for two reasons. One, y'all probably saw the video of the Francis Scott Key Bridge with that, that barge that just ran into that cargo ship that looked to me like it was just way overstuffed. Looked like they put too many boxes on there. And so it hit that bridge and just to see it collapse. I mean, I just never thought I would see that. It broke. Last Sunday, when I was in here, right during in the middle of the service, now a lot of you all did not know this, and I'm so glad because I was really embarrassed when it happened, but uh, the belt that was around my waist, this belt broke. Now, I was holding, I had on this belt, I had my, uh, my, basically my microphone, which is heavy, and the thing started sagging. I'm like, what is wrong with this? And then I realized, okay, it broke right there at the belt buckle, and I could not put it back together. And um, <laughs> so I, I didn't want to tell anybody. I, don't, I wanted folks to be on God and not on me during the service. And, and so I thought, i got to do something with this. And so during one part, I tried to be a little nonchalant, and I was just turning around this way when I was down here. And uh, I just kind of just real slyly took off my belt, and I put it over here. And uh, after the service, when I got home, I was talking to Sherry about it. And Sherry said, Bill, I, she goes, I saw you taking off your belt, and I couldn't figure out what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it broke. Um, a few years ago, I came into the worship service, no kidding, and all of a sudden, the sole of my shoe fell off. It, 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 it too broke. And I'm like, my goodness, is like, Lord, I, I think I get the message. <laughs> Don't put your faith in anything that you see, anything that you have in this life, because you can't count on it. But friends, what the Easter message is, is this. We may have been born into a dead hope, but we have something better now. Right? Because the scripture says from 1 Peter 1, 3, because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. This fills us with a dead hope? No, it fills us with a living hope. That's what the scripture says. So if you are a follower of Jesus today, your faith, your hope is as real as the pews that you're sitting in. Your hope walks on two feet. Let that sink in. Your hope in this life isn't in what's made, but in who made you. It's not in what you get, but your hope is in the God whose name is Jesus who gets you. Your hope has a name. It's Jesus. Now, if Jesus is not your hope, the, the, the real deal is, is that everything that you're depending on, it's going to fail. Okay? It's, it's, it's not going anywhere. Some people put their hope, in, especially in this town. I love Athens. It's, it's the favorite city, my favorite city I've ever lived in throughout my life. And, um, but a lot of people here put their hope in their education. Some put it in philosophy. But your hope, my hope, walks in a physical, resurrected body. Yeah, that's, that's what Jesus carries. Now, a lot of people wonder, okay, Jesus left earth 2,000 years ago. What is Jesus doing now? Well, guess what? He's doing the same thing today that he did back then. You'll find the answer from Acts 10, 38, because what it says here is, is that Jesus was known by going around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Guess what? Jesus broke the devil's grip on Andrew Pierce three weeks ago. He smashed it. And Jesus says, no, I died for him. He's mine. He's still doing it today. Jesus, and there may be 
Some of you may be under the devil's control, not in the sense that you've given your life to the devil, or you've made a pact with him, or you worship him, but no, maybe it's a sin that he is controlling you by, he's exerting his influence that way, maybe it's hopelessness, maybe it's depression, but there's something, there's a lot of ways that the evil one can exert influence over us, and we need to be free of that. The only answer is Jesus. He's always been the answer. It's Jesus. And he is still doing good. Jesus is. Night and day. Day and night. Do you realize that Jesus does good by giving you everything you need to believe in him and what he does for you? Now, look at the scripture if you have it with you. If you have it in your Bible or on the Bible app... It says here from John 20, verse 8, it says the other disciple, a lot of of people believe that this was John, the same John who wrote the Gospel of John that's being talked about here that's not named, um, that he also wrote Revelation, that John is this guy who got to the tomb, okay? He He basically outran Peter. So if you had like, if you're doing a 40 time between him and Peter, he would have outrun Peter a lot faster. He may have been a a 4-2 kind of guy. Who knows? But he was was, um, making a beeline as fast as he could to the tomb. So it says in verse 8, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. Notice this. He saw and what happened? He saw and he believed. God gives you everything that you need to believe that he is who he says he is. That he walked out of that grave 2,000 years ago. One of the clues that he gave these early disciples was, was that the stone had been moved. Now this in and of itself doesn't seem to us like as much, but it was a whole lot. The stone had been taken away. What Matthew's gospel tells us is that Father God from heaven sent an angel to come and move that stone away, push it away, and then he sat on it. Now, the question is, why did God move the stone? Think about it. It wasn't so that Jesus could get out. He could do that all by himself. I mean, at this point in a physical resurrected body, he could move through a stone like that. He could walk right through it. It wasn't so that Jesus could get out. It was so that people could get in and they could see what had happened. Oh my gosh, his body was here and now it has completely disappeared. That would have given them part of the evidence they needed to believe. Next thing is that Jesus did. I want you to notice about the grave clothes. So when Jesus died, and this was common back then, they would wrap you kind of like a mummy. They'd start at the feet and they would wrap you. And now this was linen, really nice cloth, linen cloth they would wrapped his body with all the way up to his neck. Then they would take another cloth and then they would wrap it around the person's head. Meanwhile, they would be packing it with myrrh and with aloe, these spices and lotions, to um, make the body smell good, to mask the smell of decomposition. So he had been packed in like this. Um, Now, I want you to notice this, is that verse 7, here's what it says, is that it was not lying, the head cloth, was not lying with the, where the linen cloths were when his body just came out of it and it collapsed. It was over here, rather. And the scripture says that it was rolled up by itself. In other words, in a different location. But I want you to notice this. It was rolled up. Now, here's what's really cool. Because even a lady um, at our first service, our first worship service today, Livonia Weldon, or excuse me, Livonia Weldon. Livonia's married to Weldon. Livonia Hardman. Livonia said a pretty cool, uh, interesting tidbit here is that back then, 2,000 years ago, the Jewish custom was was that when you were sitting at a table and you were having dinner with somebody, if you needed to go use the restroom and you planned on coming back, 
what you would do is you would take the cloth and you would wrap it up very neatly and you would place it right there by the plate. That was the cue, the clue to the people around the table, I'm coming back. If somebody wanted to pull the world's greatest hoax, if they had tried this back then, if they had tried to move the stone while the Roman guards were sitting there watching all night long, and you may say, well, what if the Roman guards fell asleep? Well, when you're moving a big stone like that, it's going to be kind of loud. It would have woken them up. But the Roman guards weren't going to allow anybody to get in that tomb because if they did and the body was stolen, guess what would happen to them? They would be executed. It would be the end of their life and they knew it. So they had to stay awake. But even, even, if they didn't and they fell asleep, whoever, if anybody was able to get in, roll the stone away, get in to get the body, they would not have sat there and played a game of checkers. Because if they would have been caught, they would have been executed. So if there had been a robbery, no thief is going to sit there and take the time to unwrap his body and then just neatly wrap it back up. He's going to take that body fully wrapped and get out of there as fast as possible, right? If he wanted to live. So by the way that Jesus' grave clothes were situated, that's God's way of saying... I did this. We also see it, the evidence with the predictions. Because no less than three times, Jesus had already predicted and told his disciples that all of this was going to happen. He told them he would be betrayed, that he would be killed, and on the third day, he would rise from the dead. So I want you to, to notice that. That's what God did back then. He still does the same thing today. He will give you everything you need to get you to the line of faith. And then once you're there, he will do even more to keep you believing in himself. In fact, the cool thing is, is that when you walk with Jesus for several years and you're really intentional about doing that, he will grow your faith to a point where it's going to feel unusual for you to live a day without even experiencing him. Because he'll be constantly in your life and you'll just know that you're in the presence of the living God. That's what God will do. Now friends, let me tell you what else God will do. In the scripture here, it says from 1 Peter 1.3, it talks about how right now in our faith, we are being made into holy people. We are, being, we are taking the, the life of Jesus into us, and so we start thinking like Jesus, we start acting like Jesus, we start loving and serving other people, just like Jesus did, and he teaches us to. And as we do that, he gives us everything that we need to live that life that life of faith for other people so they too can meet the risen God. And I love what he does in verse 1, 2. It says, may grace and peace be yours. Be yours. Raise your hand. Say, I'm yours. <laughs> yeah, that's what, you told, that's what you tell Jesus. I'm yours. May grace and peace be yours in full measure. Now, here's what that phrase means. In the Greek, in full measure, it literally means may, may grace be multiplied to you. God doesn't do grace like we do. Aren't you glad? <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh. You know, we struggle to give people grace. Here, listen, here's just a real quick um, back of the hand definition. Grace is anything that God does for you that you don't deserve. Uh, by the way, which is everything. Okay, I mean, it really is. God doesn't have to be kind to you. God doesn't have to love you. He chooses to. Man, that's what grace is. Oh, give us more, God, right? So I love it because if we're going to do something kind for somebody, if we're going to do something 
uh, for somebody else to help them, we'll give them some grace. We'll give them as much grace as we can. We do it with addition. One act of grace plus another act of grace equals two acts of grace, right? We, we do it that way. We can count it on your hand. God doesn't do that. He uses a calculator. It's like 10 times 10 equals 100. May grace be multiplied, not added, multiplied to you. Mm. Jack Bush, going off script here. I saw you up here playing the trumpet. I saw the glory of God falling on you. I saw it in the spirit. Now, I didn't know what to do with it, but I do now. God's got you covered. But I saw your wife, Susan, singing in heaven. And the, the one word that God wants you to know is, is that she is living in joy. I mean, I just saw joy when she was just singing in heaven. Joy. We live under grace. And that is the best place you and I will ever put our two feet. Let me go to the next slide. There we go. So, about, uh, music team, you can help me with this, about three weeks ago or so, um, our music team gave this jersey here to a wonderful guy, um, husband in our congregation. His name is Michael Hook. Michael lost his wife a few months ago. Um, she died, and uh, her name was Grace. And just a wonderful, wonderful lady. My gosh, I tell you what, she is heaven's gain, <laughs> for sure. Um, I, I just love that woman. She was just, she taught us so much about how to live by faith. So um, she died, like I said, last fall, and the music team gave them gave Michael this jersey. Well, Grace and Michael have been planning on going on a spring, um, kind of like for spring training to go down and see the Atlanta Braves because they're baseball, baseball fans. So they had planned on going down to Florida together, um, and, but she had her home going first. So um, the music team gave, them, uh, gave him this jersey. By the way, she was born in 1955. That's where the number comes from. And so Michael, though his wife is in heaven now, Michael was able to go with one of his sons, and they went down to spring training down in Florida, and they were able to catch a, a Braves game. And when Michael showed me this picture, when he got back from Florida, I think like last Wednesday, I looked at it, and I thought, okay, wait a second, this isn't a normal picture. This has God all over it. This is like, we got to see this on Easter. So you look at that, and what, what that signifies to me is look at the blue sky above. And it's such a great visual description of the fact that we, friends, we live under grace. I'm so glad that Grace Hook knew Jesus. And because she knew Jesus, grace will never end. And God, if you're a believer, God's grace will never end in your life. It'll just keep on. He'll keep that calculator in his hand, and he's going to keep on multiplying and keep on multiplying in those areas where you lack so much. The person you hope in has a name. Your hope walks. Your hope talks. Your hope lives. Your hope rules. Your hope has a name. And what is that name? Yeah. No, that wasn't good enough. What is that name? Yeah. There you go, church. And because Jesus lives, you will also live. Always. Under His grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is done. Amen.
would you, would you pray with me, please? Because I'm just, I'm just sensing God wanting to move here. Um, hmm. Some of you all feel very fragile right now. Um, I, I, just, I see it very clearly in the Spirit. It's like a, it's almost like an egg. An egg is very fragile. It doesn't take much to break it. You have a thin shell on your life, and you feel like you're about to crack. Hmm. If you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ... Why should you wait any longer? Please don't make that mistake. I did, and it cost me a lot because I didn't get saved until I was much older in life. Jesus is here right now. He's in this auditorium. If you want to receive His grace and receive eternal life that He offers you, I want you to I want you in your heart to say yes. And if you'd like to do so, I'm not going to make you feel uncomfortable about this, but here's what I'm going to do. There are other believers in here who need God's grace as well in your life. Parts of your life may be going well, but there's like, there's like an area um, where, where things are really, really hard and you need more of His grace to fall on you now. You needed it yesterday, but you're, you're asking for it now. If you would like to receive more of God's grace, if you're a believer or if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ today, would you raise your hand now? Okay, I saw a lot of hands go up at nine. I'm seeing many go up here as well. Okay, fantastic. Put down your hands. Let me talk, first of all, to the believers. So if you're a believer, you've already given your heart to Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I ask that you would send it down now strong. Just like your glory came down on Jack Bush as he was playing the trumpet, so I pray, God Almighty, that you would allow your presence to fall. Would you fill up those areas, God, that are hurting, that are confused, that need healing, maybe physical healing, but especially emotional healing, would you touch those places and make them right? Fix them, God. Bless them and let them know you did it. Now, for those of you who need Jesus because you haven't received him, here's what you need to say. In your heart, just do this. Say, Jesus, I am sorry because I have sinned. I've done some things that were wrong, and I know it. Jesus, I've looked everywhere else. I, I'm turning to you. I need you. Forgive me for my sins. Take them away. Give me eternal life. I promise to love you and serve you all the rest of my days. Now, if you prayed that prayer, let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill them up. Fill them up. Fill them up, God. Make them feel brand new. In Jesus it is done. Amen.